Uh, I'm Martin Fowler. I write things on the internet. Um, I spend a lot of my time thinking about how to communicate interesting software ideas. But as a result of that, I spend all my time doing that. I don't actually do anything that's kind of real. I have to rely on people like Toby here um, to tell me what's going on. And uh, every so often, I kind of try and pluck things out of him. But here, you'll get to, to, to hear from him directly instead of through me as a mediator, which is definitely uh, an improvement. <laughs> so we're going to talk today about using events to get an experimentation in a system, which immediately raises the question, why are we, are we talking about experimentation? And I think a way to think about how we get here um, is if we look at the way software teams have developed over time, there was a sense of sort of in oldie days, and actually not that oldie, people would just come up with big influence in statements about this is all the things we want you to go and do, go away for a few years and come back and tell us when you've done it. And we've shifted away from that. And a large driver of what's shifted away from that has been the notion of agile software development and the notion that instead we should have a different way of relating with things. But agile software development works in a number of different ways. And one approach of looking at this that I found very handy was a model called the Agile Fluency Model. It was developed by a couple of people not connected with ThoughtWorks, um, but they, I felt, had a good sense of talking about the way they saw different teams work in different ways. So to very, very quickly go through it, um, the basic idea is that there's a, there's a first level which is referred to as focusing. And focusing is all about really saying, how do I um, change the management style of a team? So that instead of looking at how much do I get done as work items ticked off, I begin to think about how do we produce business value. And that's a relatively straightforward step. It's more the management style of, of agile approaches, um, the notion of iterations, and that kind of thing. To get really better at this, though, you really need to raise the productivity and get the things going faster and faster. And this is this second stage, which is called the delivering stage. And the point of the delivering stage is that you then take on the technical practices. You do things like testing and refactoring and continuous integration and stuff like that that allows you to release more rapidly drastically reduces the amount of uh, defects in the system and basically allows you to ship when the market needs it as opposed to ship when you're ready. And that is a very crucial step because now I can ship, I can release every day and things of that kind. But it's all very well to release every day but you're still responding a little bit passively as to what to build. The next step takes that a little bit further and says now the team itself is going to decide what to build. An experiment. This is where the experimentation comes in of how to build things. The fourth stage is more a speculation about the Agile's future, so I, I tend to skip over that and focus instead on that third stage. And a term that often goes with it is hypothesis-driven development. And the idea here is that when looking to build something, rather than try and come up with you know, very many thoughts about what might build and, and fixing at it. Instead, you say, well, let's try something. Let's get it out there. Let people use it. See how people react. And then decide, oh, well, I would further go down that path or maybe even kill that feature entirely and go somewhere else. That requires the ability to be able to try things out and see how people respond to things so that you can conduct experiments <coughs> carefully. And that's why experimentation is important. And now... Over to Toby. So in order to uh, explore this idea that um, event-driven systems can help with experimentation, we're going to uh, run through a bit of an experience report. And that experience report is in the context of the company I'm working with at the moment um, called Be Social. And Be Social is a digital challenger bank um, looking to kind of disrupt the banking industry and build apps that customers love and that provide kind of value to customers in the banking space that they haven't really experienced before. But in order to disrupt and try different things and build something that customers love, we decided to adopt this, this approach of, of kind of experimenting, trying different things, learning from, from real life situations and real life customers, and help, having that help drive our, our kind of product development process. Um, 
But obviously, in order to experiment, we need systems that help us experiment. Lots of our experiments were quick and easy prototypes or throwaway things, but at the same time, we were trying to build a bank, and we needed to kind of define some kind of system that both met the needs of us being a bank, but also was easy to change, easy to experiment with, evolutionary in its nature. So where did we start? We could have started with a monolith. This is typically sage advice from Martin. Start with a monolith because you don't really know your system yet, you don't really know your domain, keep it all in one box, keep it simple and easy to change. However, in our case, we chose not to do that. We had a pretty mature team, they'd built lots of microservice implementations before, um, they had lots of experience of operating, deploying, scaling those kinds of systems, and so instead, we decided not to go ahead with monolith. And of all my regular advice is to build a monolith first. You know, I, I do take that I think Toby did the right thing with his team, but I do want to caution teams out there. Do not do this unless you really understand how to build distributed service-based systems and you've got some real experience in doing this because although this team has worked out well with this approach, most of the times I've seen people attempt to do this, it's not been pretty. So be careful about going down that path. And there were kind of two, two parts to that, that risk, I think. There was the, when you, when you move to something like a microservice architecture, you push a lot of the complexity into the deployment model, into the kind of gaps between the services. Um, and the other part is not really being able to easily model your domain when it's already distributed and you've got kind of network, network partitions between all of the pieces. We actually mitigated the first by investing really heavily in infrastructure as code and automation. And so we decided to kind of build open source implementations of all of our, all of our kind of deployment infrastructure and, and kind of um, our container runtime and everything. So we, by, by kind of automating all of that away, we made it very cheap and easy to take this approach. So we could spin up services very fast, throw them away very fast, um, kind of in the order of minutes or hours rather than weeks or months. Um, and that also helped in, this, in terms of being able to experiment because we could, you know, it didn't really matter how long lived something was because it was so cheap to kind of build and, and get rid of. And I should point out, one of the nice things about working with ThoughtWorks is that when we come up with stuff like this, we tend to open source it rather than keep it quiet. And so I'm really pleased to see that the team has done that. Um, okay, so then where did we start? What was our first evolution of the architecture? We decided to go with microservices. Um, we, built, we were building kind of mobile apps, digital, everything kind of um, through, through a mobile device, digital first, and built a back end for front end for that, to kind of cater to that device. And then lots of small collaborating services kind of dedicated to one particular task. And each of those services had their own dedicated database. In our case, we used Postgres. It was just kind of simple and easy for us to use in our, based on the cloud provider we were using. And um, that, that let us kind of have persistence on a, on a service by service basis in a cheap way. And I really want to stress, this is one of these important things about microservices. The term microservices makes people often think, oh, they're just small services. But there's other characteristics that really make that the style. A very important part of that is each service having its own data store. I've seen people build microservices where they're small services on top of a shared database. Um, for a start, that's not microservices because it contravenes the definition. And secondly, just don't do that because it's really very, very painful. Um, so important part of thinking, if you're going to go down a microservice route, there is a reason why you have your own database in each service. And each of these services communicated synchronously. We didn't really have um, huge load at this point in our evolution, and, so, and, and it, was, it was a lot simpler for us to just have these services communicating synchronously, so we kind of kept things simple. In terms of the, the, the um, APIs that these services used, initially it was a bit, bit of a free-for-all. We just kind of did whatever made sense. But we quickly hit the limitations of this and found that it made it very difficult to evolve our APIs over time if we weren't quite intentional about the way in which we did it. So we moved very fast towards making everything an object, nice and easy to expand and evolve as you go. But then even from there, we went further and decided to go with full hypermedia APIs. The reason being that we wanted to be able to kind of throw out new services see if they helped, see if they worked, potentially replace them, throw them away, put other things in their place, or move our entities around in our system landscape. And so making, using hypermedia meant that we were kind of location independent with where things lived in the overall system. 
um, and we could, we could make those kinds of moves. So we, we found that hypermedia was something really valuable to us in terms of giving us flexibility in our architecture. And this is an interesting point. I mean, I'll come across a lot of people that are using RESTful systems, and why, when they do that, really what they're meaning is they're saying, well, we think in terms of resources, and we use the HTTP verbs and error codes and things of that kind, which is all well and good, but there's a common statement out there that says, well, well you don't really need to do this hypermedia thing. Um, the clients can know all the URLs. They don't really need to change very often. But there are times where it really does make a difference. I mean, here in a case, it allows the team to change their service boundaries around. I've known another case where it was really helped a huge amount with scaling because they ran into big scaling issues and were able to shift everything out to the edge, serv edge servers and were able to do that really easily because they had the, 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 these hypermedia links. So don't neglect the value of having these full URLs. The ideal test with this is that clients should only know a single URL, which is the entry point to your whole system. Every other URL should be gained by interrogating um, that uh, initial URL in order to lead you to all the other paths. That gives you then the flexibility, complete flexibility about where you place the various services. Then in terms of persistence, we kept things very simple. Um, we were using the kind of JSON capabilities of Postgres and we just dumped everything about our entities into the database um, in a pretty basic JSON structure. Um, and actually we only kept the snapshots. We kept the latest version of everything. So we were throwing a lot of information away but at this point we hadn't really thought any better um, and so we just kind of had really kind of basic high level information about uh, the entities in the system. So what did this do for us? This gave us the ability to build things very fast throw them out there, see whether they work, see whether they contributed to their overall system and the overall product. And then if they didn't, throw them away, and it didn't really matter that much. Didn't really take a lot of unpicking to do so because they were already small, discrete, and independent. It meant that we could use the right tool for the job. So anytime a service had a particular need, it needed a certain type of persistence or uh, maybe a certain language or library or whatever, we could easily kind of use that language, use that library without you know, complexity of it all being in one box inside one process or whatever else. And if we managed to come up with experiments that were successful and actually keep those bits of our systems, because we'd already teased out kind of scaling boundaries and, and levers for scaling, we could easily scale up or improve those services independently as we needed to. However, the whole goal was to be able to um, experiment and make measurements and understand our customers' behavior. And because we weren't really storing deep or, or fine-grained information about our customers and what they were doing, we had no way to measure anything. And we didn't really have any way to capture customer intent. So we decided to look at alternative or extensions to our architecture, evolutions of our architecture, that meant that we would keep the things on the left and gain the things on the right. So we looked into event sourcing. So Jay mentioned event sourcing very briefly and in his talk. I'll explain a little bit more about how I see that term um, defined. And it begins really with very much the way that he talked about this duality between events and tables. So if we imagine a system without any events, um, I've got a user, I've got some customer information, and that customer says, hey, I'd like to change my address. What happens? You just make the change in the database. Blow away the old record, put a new record in. In the event sourcing world, we make a, an important, subtle but important change to this. If, when somebody says change my address, the first thing we do is we create a first class event record. And that event record is stored. Then we process that event record in order to make the change to our current state. Essentially, what we've now got is those two things that Jay talked about. We have the tables, the application state, and we have this history log of all the changes that ever changed to it. Okay, that's kind of event, standard eventing kind of stuff. The key thing that makes something event sourced is that I should be able to confidently at any time just blow away my application state. I can then comfortably record, restore it from the log and rebuild the state again. So, quick question. How many people have actually built a system using this kind of event sourced approach where you can blow away your current state? A uh, few people. Um, how many people have used a system doing this? Raise your hands. A few people. Okay, how many people write software for a living? 
In which case, I'm very worried that you said you haven't used a system that's used this approach. Because every software developer uses a system that uses this approach. What's it called? <laughs> Version control, Git, they're not actually synonymous, <laughs> but, the, but these days it feels like it. This is what version control is, right? At any time, I blow away my working tree, I create one, anything I can, and all think of all the advantages, all the wonderful things that you can do with a version control system. That's what event sourcing allows you to do with your business data. In fact, there's an even older event source system that's been around since ooh, medieval times, which is accounting systems. They record every transaction. You add them up in order to get a balance. That's effectively event sourcing. And those are the two examples I like to use of event sourcing. When you're trying to think about how to use it, or the advantages, or all the rest of it, fall back to accounting systems and to version control. And of course, the advantage of accounting systems is that makes sense to non-geeks. Um, but version control is probably the more familiar one for us as a day-to-day -day basis. So when you're thinking of event sourcing, it's how do we bring the advantages of what we can do with Git to our uh, business data. So, what did you do with it? Well, the second evolution of our system was exactly this. We decided to uh, switch to an event sourcing approach. So actually, the, the kind of architecture at this level didn't really change a great deal. But in terms of our persistence, we kind of radically changed things under the covers and decided that, I mean, still relatively simple. We still made use of all of the kind of JSON storage features of our, our underlying database, but kept a bit more information this time in terms of the um, events that, that made up the different interactions in our system. Um, and so we basically stored the complete content of any request as made um, by a consumer of a service against some type. And whenever we wanted to reproduce the entities that we had before, we would project based on all of the entities that pertain to that, uh, sorry, any, all of the events that pertain to that entity or um, entities. So this gave us um, services that each encapsulated and owned a set of events that pertain to their aggregate route. Um, and that kind of helped a lot because we could then see what was going on. We could measure things. We could count things. We could inspect those payloads and understand what um, our, our customers had, had passed us, what we were being given. Um, but they were still relatively separate. They were, they were kind of encapsulated within their services. So we got visibility into the business events as they were taking place and measurability of our customers' behaviors. But we were still lacking our kind of cross-service event visibility. Um, we needed this because um, for, some reason, for some things it was to do with uh, the experiment measurements themselves. We, we wanted to be able to measure things that had kind of maybe complex interrelations across a suite of services. Um, we also had functional requirements that needed this in terms of being able to notify, say, push notifications to the user based on things that are going on or um, notifications between services so that, say, a customer deactivating their account can propagate through the system. We also didn't have any way to kind of aggregate up. So there were certain things we wanted to do that were truly aggregates across many services of different things that had been going on, and it was very difficult to do this. So the only way we could really run these experiments, make these measurements across service, was to dig into each database, pull a bunch of data out, and kind of manually play around with it, which worked for a while, but we found that we needed to evolve further. Okay, so the third evolution, the goal was to get cross-service event visibility and keep everything else if we could. So initially, we looked at the idea of having event feeds, where those feeds were just a JSON endpoint exposed by each service that gave a list of every event that had happened in some nice, easy-to-consume JSON form. And then consumers would look at these event feeds and pull them, pulling information as and when they needed to on whatever frequency they needed to and reacting to those events. And this worked okay. It gave us some benefits. It was nice and human-readable. We could kind of detect or look into problems quite easily, debug what was going on, or maybe write little scripts to understand events that were happening in the, in the live services. And... Um, we could choose the, our, our, our windows for those events, so how often, we, how frequently we um, polled. But we could also scan back through all of history. And so if we needed to spin up a new service that had a new responsibility or was it running a different experiment, it was very easy for us to rebuild its state of the world, even for things that had happened in its, before it even existed. Um, so that was kind of a really nice feature of this approach. However, on the, in terms of downsides, all of the, the kind of coordination logic um, in terms of having competing consumers trying to churn through this event feed lived in the consumer. And every time we span up a new consumer, we had to handle the same old problems of 
of kind of how do we make sure that we only process our events once or how do we make sure that um, we can kind of spread the load across many instances of those services and that was becoming kind of painful. So in the end we scrapped this and decided to look into something a bit different. And so we looked at the idea of an event bus and the goal here was to push a lot of the complexity around managing um, the competing consumers problem, the coordination of those events and the long-term storage of those events and replayability of those events into some other system that just kind of handled that complexity itself so that consumers could much more easily consume that information without having to do a whole bunch of work on their own. So the question is, of course, where would we find something like an event bus? Anyone got any ideas where we might find it? Wouldn't it be Behind great? You. Behind <laughs> us? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Kafka. <laughs> so why did you pick Kafka, though? Yeah, so actually we, we, we looked at Kafka. We were looking at a number of different things. Um, we looked at some message queue infrastructure, but the trouble there was that we didn't have kind of nice, a nice way to spin up a new service and resume from all of history, even if that service was brand new. Um, and we looked at some of the kind of cloud offerings. We were using Amazon, so we were looking at Kinesis. But with Kinesis, we didn't really have a great deal of control over retention times or, well, control over anything, to be honest. Um, and so instead, we decided to... Roll our, own, like roll our own, deploy our own, and go with Kafka as our underlying event bus infrastructure. So this was good. We continued. But it seemed like we had a number of different options about how we could um, connect our services together through Kafka. And one approach would have been to look directly at our data stores, hook up with something like Kafka Connect so that it could kind of pull that information out and feed it into, into Kafka so that our consumers can consume that stuff. We didn't feel very comfortable with this because we wanted the flexibility to have different data stores, maybe evolve and change data stores over time, and also to kind of map events over time so that we could un evolve the underlying representations whilst keeping a consistent view of those events across, across the wire. And so we thought maybe we could instead uh, push events from our services directly into Kafka, um, and then consumers would read those and everyone would be happy. But again, we didn't quite feel comfortable with this because we wanted to retain our, our separate persistent stores as the kind of source of truth for all of those events. We didn't want Kafka to become our persistence layer because we kind of wanted to be able to throw things away and rebuild them and have kind of independent, no single point of failure, that kind of thing. And the risk here was that you write an event to the database and then for some reason fail to write it into Kafka and so you end up having to build all sorts of retry logic to make sure that events are synchronized between those two locations. So we weren't too fond of this approach either. In the end, the approach we went with was to keep our event feeds in a slightly varied, varied form, but to keep those event feeds in, in kind of JSON endpoints and have Kafka Connect pull that at whatever frequency we needed to. So we kept our kind of uh, human readability of those things um, and we had resilience here. So if the transaction, in this case, the transaction service was down for a while and then came back, Kafka Connect would catch up and vice versa. And so we took this approach instead where um, we kind of had maybe a couple more moving parts, but it gave us a whole bunch of additional benefits. So now our kind of service landscape evolved. It still had all of its kind of synchronous communications, and where a synchronous communication worked for us, we kept it. But we now had the ability to um, have cross-service event visibility and things um, reacting to events in the system at a distance, effectively. So we got cross-service event visibility, we got the ability to aggregate up events when we needed to. The only thing we were lacking at this point, and which we're still lacking to this day, in fact, is ad hoc data analysis. So we would like to be able to kind of um, look for something we want to measure that's going on in, a, in the production live system that we had never thought of before and do so with tooling that actually helps us to do that. So in terms of future evolutions, we now have um, event feeds um, provided by all of our services full visibility into everything that's going on in the system. We have a nice, easy way of moving those events around. But what we've found is that this gives us a huge amount of flexibility in terms of where to go next. So we could introduce a data lake and all of the kind of big data tooling that goes with that if we want this kind of ad hoc analysis or much bigger analysis of data. Or there's a number of different um, streaming technologies out there that we can use. So Apache Spark will give us this kind of streaming approach or Kafka Streams itself wrapped up by another little service, say. So we, we haven't yet got to this stage, but what we're finding is that having invested in Kafka, having kind of put this infrastructure in place, now we have a whole bunch of flexibility opening up that didn't exist before. 
But there is actually a bit of a warning here. Um, it is nice to say, well, we've got all these events flying around, we can find them all. All sorts of clients can reach in and do analytics on, there's all sorts of interesting stuff that can happen, a kind of uh, a much more um, ad hoc, uh, there's a, I'm losing the word for it, a way of it pulling things together. But there is a danger, we actually discussed this um, at the Fort Works Radar meeting a, a few weeks ago. One of the problems you get is that people will actually use and start relying on internal messages. And the problem with people using and relying on them is that it can stop people from changing them. Because if you change an internal event, you end up breaking a system you never even heard of. And then you continue with that cycle a couple of times, and people are scared to change anything. So there's a real trade-off here. You have to be very careful as to if you're going to reach in and start playing around with internal stuff, it really needs to be out of low um, quality of service guarantees. You've got to be aware that things can break. But there's a dangerous balancing act. Um, not a dangerous balancing act, a tricky balancing act to play with that. So be wary of that when you're trying to ex ex expose things that really ought to be internal. It can lead a coupling and dependency that can be actually quite difficult. Okay, so what are the key takeaways from all of this? We've found that events provide us with measurability and they capture customer intent. And this is really useful when it comes to being able to experiment with your, with your customer base, but with your system as well. Um, but in order to make this work, events should be encapsulated and treated as first class within your, within your system. Um, and that if you go so far as, as implementing this kind of approach with full cross-service event visibility, then something like Kafka handles a huge amount of the complexity for you and provides lots of future flexibility as well. So overall, we're pretty happy with it. Okay, thank you. And if you have any more questions, do feel free to come and talk to us. Um, we're going to be around for both days of the conference. But if you actually want an, an, an answer to a question, you're probably better to go with Toby because he actually knows what's going on. Thank you. Thank you.